book of Ecclesiastes, we have the discussion of life, but as we'll see in a moment, talk about some of the terms, life is viewed within a very defined box. It's called under the sun. And the, the philosopher or the wisdom teacher who is presenting this is saying, I can't find meaning in life under the sun. I pursued all these different avenues, and as you already know from the book, there are many different avenues. Present. I can't find the meaning of life. Well, what's the answer? Every once in a while, not often, but in this book, we have a glimpse of finding meaning above the sun. In God, in some way, there is a, uh, a message in this book that is very, very important, which we actually will tie together, I hope, in a nice Christmas package at the end of the book, but it is a message that the only way you can find meaning in life under the sun is to go above the sun and to find it in God. Keep God's commandments, fear God and keep his commandments is the concluding message of this book. However, just like this puzzle, many of us spend life, and, and if, if it's true of us, it's especially true of those who don't know the Lord, spend life pursuing, spending a lot of energy pursuing the meaning of life under the sun. And what Ecclesiastes tells us is that we will never find it. We will never find that meaning under the sun until we look elsewhere. And of course that elsewhere is found in a relationship with God. There's more to Ecclesiastes, the message, than just this, but this is an important one, I think, of, of, uh, of understanding the book enough. Last time we left off, I want to go back to this, of um, looking at, I think this is helpful as we get into more de details of the book today. We, we talked about different approaches that folks have taken to this book that are helpful to, um, for us to, at least to think about. And we may not agree with all of them, but each one of them in some ways brings helpful points to our study of the book. Helpful insights, I guess, would be a better way. Um, a, a, a way to approach it that I think, number one, is, is I think most of us realize that this could not be the case, is somehow this writing of a carnal man, uh, of, as the New Testament word uses, of a man whose heart is away from God, somehow it crept into our scriptures. And, and it's there as an example to us, don't be like this. This is a person with a bad attitude about life, and the encouragement of the wisdom writing is to give us an example of someone who has a completely worldly perspective as a lesson to those of us who are studying it. Uh, a second approach is this book does include some positive elements. And at times, there's a little bit of a glimpse of optimism, but for the most part, there's a lot of pessimism. And we could, we could take that in in a couple of ways, number two says, the approach to number two, is that this is almost a schizophrenic kind of person who is going through this internal debate, uh, much like it would seem that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7. The very things that he knows that are right to do, those are the things that he does not do. And, and our assumption then is prob probably because of sin in, in life, but this person is debating within himself, and that's why we see these these negative broodings of, of his reflection on life. But every once in a while, there's a little bit of sunshine that pops through, references to God and so forth, and so we see him debating this within himself. Uh, the third view, which is what Kidner leans toward, and we left off, I think, with this one last time, it, I think is, it's probably the one that I've, I've changed my mind on this several times, but probably the one that I've leaned toward more than any other, and that is, we, in, in wisdom writings, we have a lot of creativity. We have a lot of um, dynamic that goes on in the presentation. And this is a creative presentation of a wisdom teacher, a wisdom writer. Kohelet is his name. And he is intentionally, dramatically presenting a point of view. At times, he is doing so with the shock effect. He wants his words from the mouth of a philosopher, from the mouth of a wisdom teacher. He wants them to be shocking. 
He, he wants him to be dramatic because that's the way life is. And so Kidner, Kidner says that this is a book that challenges the secularist to, to look at life and, and present it almost in a role-playing kind of way. And so this wisdom teacher, Kohelet, is presenting this point of view in order to show us that it's a dead-end street, in order to show us that it really doesn't get anywhere. And therefore, what we're listening to is not necessarily ideas that a wise teacher believes, but these are ideas that are intended to challenge the secularist and, and his point of view. I think there's a lot of merit to, to that third view. Um, probably has, has elements to it that I still lean toward this, to this day. I have to admit that even mo though my notes, if you look more carefully at the notes I provided for you uh, in our course pack about Ecclesiastes, even though they still claim there <laughs> that Solomon is the author of the book, I have to admit that the fourth view here has been one that has really intrigued me the last couple of years. Um, I, I have a lot of respect for Tremper Longman for his, his writing and his analysis. Um, at, times, at times, he really stretches me to think about new things, and I think he does a lot of people. And he, he has really uh, written well, um, and I have it right here somewhere, in his commentary on Ecclesiastes. Um, it's in the uh, NICOT series, the New International Commentary of the Old Testament. Longman has written in, in this a rather creative approach to the book that decides against Solomonic authorship and also presents the book as actually coming from more than one writer. And I want to summarize the ideas a little bit here. Um, I have it on the screen, uh, some of what he says. The book represents the perspective of, of two people. Kohelet, a fictional autobiographical testimony using Solomon's persona. I'll unpack this a little bit. And this would be the bulk of the book from chapter 212 up through the last chapter, verse 7. But he also believes, Longman presents the book as, um, as presenting a structure that one can verify as you look into other literature surrounding this period of time and later, and he particularly goes to the cultural liter literature that is in Akkadian, in Akkadian literature. He actually, uh, in his book, documents the study of 15 different pieces of literature that come out of Akkadian um, uh, writings that support this idea. And basically, he says that the book is introduced and ended with a prologue and epilogue. Uh, not exactly the same thing, but if you remember what we said about the book of Job, this would be the same idea that he has, that there is a shift, and the parameters um, of, these, of this would be at, at verse 12, and then again at verse 8 of chapter 12, 2, 12, and 8, and 12, 8, would be the switch again, moving away from this center section that is in an autobiographical form. Uh, one of the key uh, hints about this structure is the center section of the book is written in the first person, and both the prologue and the epilogue are written in the third person. Speaking of, now Kohelet appears all the way through, we'll define who Kohelet might be, but Kohelet is, in the, is spoken of in the third person in both the prologue and the, and the epilogue. And uh, in the middle of the book, he's speaking in the first person. And that's why we call it autobiographical. He is speaking as though he has experienced all of this. The other uh, contribution or the other element that I think is interesting about, uh, about Tremper Longman's approach is that he takes on the, he, he says that this is not Solomon, but that much of the book is presented as if it were Solomon, uh, the persona of Solomon. He, and uh, Longman, um, again, heavily depending on supportive literature from around, uh, is saying things uh, that would be common 
in that, in, a, in that writing period from Solomon after in wisdom writings. And one of those things would be that one can present wisdom in such a way and choose a person that would well represent that point of view. Even though you are not that person, it is written as if you were that person in an autobiographical sense. Um, I don't know what all this does in, in your view of the inspiration of Scripture, if there's any struggles that you would have with all of this. I have to admit, um, I don't embrace it necessarily. I'm intrigued a bit by it because I, I will be the first to admit that Ecclesiastes is one of those books of the Bible that almost defies organization. There is really not a clear way of organizing the book. Uh, in, that, in that sense, it, it falls into the same category of Song of Solomon, where you have a really wide variety of views of how you would even organize the logic of this book. Longman's approach, based on um, literature surrounding, potentially surrounding this, does explain a lot about the organization of the book. I mean, it gives a much clearer understanding of why the book is organized, especially, I think, the elements of prologue and epilogue. He calls it the frame, that this book is written with a frame around it, and in the middle of that frame is an autobiographical story uh, written as if it were the character of Solomon. Now, since that throws a lot of us, and I will admit it even throws me because I have taken the traditional view for many years. Um, by the way, that this traditional view that Solomon is absolutely the author, I think you, you've heard this view before, that likely Solomon now, at the end of his life, comes to his senses after seeing the destructiveness of his, of his power, the destructiveness of his wealth, and the way that he has led the country. We know from the historical books that Solomon's kingdom was in bad shape at the end of his reign. And in fact, I think you all know the story. Um, his son Rehoboam uh, faces the split of the kingdom over the problems that have been created by Solomon's rule. And in fact, this, the kingdom does split. That's why we have a northern and southern kingdom. Uh, taxation was so heavy, Solomon was wealthy himself, but he also created a huge bureaucracy. Um, I know the election's over, but I, uh, I regularly find this a commentary on our modern issues. Is big government a good thing? Solomon's story would argue that it is not a good thing, that Solomon created a bureaucracy that taxes could not support. He was actually guilty of deficit spending. He was involved in borrowing money from others around, and it ultimately led to the split of his kingdom. At least, that's not the spiritual reason in Scripture, but it is the human reason. There was a rebellion, Jeroboam, who became king of the northern kingdom, satisfied the people by saying, I'm going to give you something else. Rehoboam, the son of, Je of Solomon, refused to change his ways. So th this was a very real issue, and uh, um, the whole idea of Solomon later in his life coming to his senses really appeals, I think, to all of us because we, we would like to think that the wisest man in the world finally did figure this out. And that, in fact, later on he looks back on his decisions and he, he realizes there was an emptiness about all of this. That's the way I've always viewed Ecclesiastes. It's the confessions of a wisdom teacher who late in his life reflects on earlier decisions that he had made. He's honestly telling us in the book of Ecclesiastes where all of this ended up, that it was vanity, that it was emptiness, and so forth. Um, so there is an appeal to claiming that Solomon is the author. Let me mention just a couple of other things. Uh, and what I'm really allowing is, is Longman's view here to kind of go into a discussion of authorship uh, beyond even, even his view. Uh, if you have your Bible there, let's turn to uh, Song of Songs, I mean to um, Ecclesiastes. Okay. 
just a few other things that have contributed to the traditional view, Solomon as the author. One one obviously said the words of Kohelet, son of David, king in Jerusalem. That certainly sounds like, like Solomon. Um, a couple of things that are clear throughout the testimony that is given in the book is that this was, this was one of the wealthiest men in the world. It was a man who was very wealthy. And secondly, it was a man who was very, very wise, who is talking about his own wisdom, that he has spent his life collecting wisdom. Those two things would certainly be descriptive, the fantastic wealth that Solomon had, his wisdom. So, so all, of, all of those factors would lead us to think, wow, this must really be Solomon. Now let me give you a few, and these aren't just from Tremper Longman, but these come from others who have said, I'm not so convinced that Solomon is the one who wrote this book. Uh, the use of a term Kohelet, we'll talk about the meaning in a moment, but it's a, it's a, it's a general term, a title. It isn't a name of someone. It simply means one who gathers together in assembly, is, is all it means. One who gathers together in assembly. Um, why would Solomon, with all of the weight that his name carries, not have given his name to the book? Why would he called, have called himself Kohelet in this book? I'm raising questions that are raised about the authorship. Uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, I, Kohelet have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now the ESV there has softened that a little, have been king over Jerusalem. It actually is a past tense. And so other translations have translated it, and translated it, I was king over Israel. Um, what, what is that all about? If Solomon basically lived up to the time and then he died as king, how could he re be referring back to, I was king over Jerusalem? Uh, there's a bit of help in some of Jewish tradition in the Targums, which are collections of Jewish writings outside of scripture. And, and Targum evidence shows us, uh, or at least claims that Solomon stepped from the throne at the very end of his life and turned it over to Rehoboam. And that was prior even to the revolt that happened. And so that he was not king at the very end of his life. There's no biblical evidence for that, but that's one claim that is made. So why would he say, I was king um, over Jerusalem? In verse 16, he said, I have acquired great wisdom. And notice this expression, surpassing all of those who were... Over, I'm sorry, all of those who were over Jerusalem before me. Well, who is that? <laughs> who was king over Jerusalem, as implied, before Solomon? That's only David. Saul isn't a king over Jerusalem. Remember, Saul doesn't take Jerusalem. Only David does. Some have suggested maybe he meant all the Jebusite kings and the Canaanite kings before. Not likely, not likely that he would be claiming that. So it's an odd expression where he is claiming this, I was, I was king, um, acquired great wealth, uh, wisdom I should say, surpassing all of those who went before me as king over Jerusalem. It's only David. It's only David. It just seems like an odd expression that is pointed out. Um, Here's one that I think is, is a kind of an interesting argument. In the book, if you go further into the details of the book, you get into passages, and I'm looking here at some of the chapters, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 10, and they all speak of the powerful who oppress the poor. It's wisdom advice as to how unfair life is, and the powerful oppress the poor, and in one of those sections, I think it's the chapter 10, it's even that the king, that the king benefits from the fields of the poor. That's an odd thing for Solomon to say, because after all, it was his system who became oppressive to the people who were poor. And 
you know, I could see arguments both ways on this one, but it is an interesting criticism of Solomon actually himself being the author, knowing that the very things that he is saying are things that he was guilty of. Um, the other argument could be maybe he had a change of heart. And maybe he is honestly, as Ecclesiastes does, looking back on, on history. And as he looks back on history, he says, the king and the powerful really are oppressive to the poor. Implied in that is, I was one of them. I was one of them. But I think you can see, with all those ideas in mind, um, what leads some to adopt an idea that we definitely find in literature surrounding the biblical literature, especially the category of wisdom literature, we find the whole um, idea of taking on the persona of a famous and, in this case, a powerful person. Why would that be done? Well, because this is going to be a wisdom writing about the vanity of power, and the vanity of of um, money and success, and one couldn't think of a better example than Solomon, who had all of that. And so the persona that is adopted by another individual, this would be Longman's view now, another individual, Kohelet, would be taking on that person of Solomon, because it's the best example that one could think of. So speaking in the first person is fictitiously speaking through the mouth of King Solomon, because that's what would have been what Solomon presented. Um, you can see why I struggle a bit with this. Maybe you immediately reject it. Um, it does it seem like there are integrity issues here <laughs> involved with God's word? Um, if something says that it is from the mouth of Solomon, are we treading on on scary ground now to talk about using the personification of Solomon. I don't know. I, I respect someone like Tremper Longman. I think he has a great view of Scripture, of the authority of Scripture. And yet, in reality, that's what he's saying, is that this is, this is not Solomon. So, to sum up, um, the structure then that would present, that would be in this fourth view here, would be, in the middle of the book, chapter 112 through chapter 127, we have this long monologue of Kohelet, the wisdom teacher. And I think we can make it a good case for Kohelet being a, a wisdom teacher. I'll do that in just a moment. And uh, in chapter uh, 1, verses 1 to 11, we have an introduction who is speaking of Kohelet in the third person. And this introduction and, I would add, the conclusion at the end of the book are attempts to make sense of this middle portion. Because left all by itself, the middle portion is, are going to be the words of, a, of an individual that sound very pessimistic and negative. And the beginning and the, end of the ending of the book, which are in the third person, then are going to frame this center portion. And uh, Tremper Longman cites examples of other literature that does exactly this, where there's a beginning and an end um, to it. Now, one of, just one other comment, um, and I get this not only from Tremper Longman, but from others as well. Um, the, the, the book, at times, rambles a bit. Uh, the book repeats itself. You could even make the case that, at times, the book contradicts itself that there are statements within it that almost seem contradictory. Should this lack of order in a book like, in a wisdom writing like Ecclesiastes, bother us? And I think I've been convinced by a number who, who, who've written about wisdom literature that it really should not bother us. And in a sense, it actually adds to the message of the book rather than distracting from it. Um, Here's a quote from uh, of one writer um, who's written a great article on, on the book of Ecclesiastes. And he says this, Kohelet is not afraid of the charge of inconsistency, but he would have his, ready, his answer ready. Why not inconsistency? Isn't life itself, itself full of inconsistencies? I, I think it's an interesting idea 
that the genre of this particular kind of writing might even reflect the struggles that someone is going through. I'm going to have you doing a little bit of uh, interacting with a couple of poems in the book in just a moment. And I really believe the mood, the mood that is created in these poems goes even beyond the words themselves. And that they're a real attempt, an attempt for anyone who is hearing or, or reading the writing of Ecclesiastes. It's an, an attempt to get the reader or the hearer to enter into this experience. Um, so this idea of rambling, uh, even contradictory ideas, doesn't seem to me to be a problem if we understand that these are the musings and the broodings of someone who is really struggling with life, going back and forth. Um, well, enough um, comment on all of that, and that would be a, a bit of, of how Tremper Longman views it, but also how others have viewed it who debate the authorship. As you can see, I'm, I'm hedging a bit on my uh, dogmatic view that Solomon is the author. Uh, at this point, I, I think I'm going to almost remain agnostic about it. I, I don't know for sure. I've, I've been convinced a little bit by some of the ideas that are here, and I just want to make sure that, that these aren't overstated. Still, still kind of wrestling through some of these things myself. I would recommend, though, uh, if you like stimulating writing about Ecclesiastes, uh, this, this particular commentary by Longman is, is really good. He's got some good analysis of the Hebrew and, and many of the passages and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's talk, we've been talking a lot about Kohelet. Let's talk a little bit about the meaning of the word. One who calls together an assembly is the basic meaning of the term Kohelet. It becomes the name of, of the narrator, the name of the wisdom teacher in the book. But we are led to ask this question, what kind of an assembly is being called together here? I think translations have led us a bit astray in, a, in just a small way, but I think it's significant. The American Standard um, has translated Kohelet preacher. Preacher. Now, most of us understand preacher to be an ecclesiastical setting, don't we? In fact, I mentioned a second thing here. The name Ecclesiastes, if you even go to the root meaning of that word, has something to do with church. Something to do with the church. We are led to believe by terms like preacher and Ecclesiastes that the, the assembly that is gathered here is some kind of an assembly maybe of worship or at least of God's people gathering together to consider God's truth. It is God's truth, but I think what is becoming what becomes very clear as we move into the content of the book that the best kind of assembly to identify this as an assembly for wisdom. And here I would cite a passage I we... Uh, we talked about earlier in the semester as we talked about whole, the wisdom literature. First Kings 4, you may remember the passage, God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure. Um, the breadth of, the, of his mind was like the sea on the sand shore and so forth. Um, goes on to talk about his great expertise, but then it gets to the last verse and it says, verse 34, People of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all of the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. I think we implied from that verse mentioned earlier our other wisdom teachers who had international renown. And so the assumption I think we can make is that in the wisdom culture of Israel, there were often gatherings of people, some of whom would actually travel long distances to sit at the feet of a sage or a wisdom teacher to learn from that wisdom teacher. That idea, I think, is the idea of the assembly here. This is not an assembly that is based upon worship or a churchy experience. This is an assembly of, I'm going to use this word in a qualified way, of philosophers that are debating life and presenting life 
and trying to understand life. This simple idea of Kohelet, the wisdom teacher, now, to me, it helps me to release my frustrations about a book like Ecclesiastes. Because if I thought somehow that these negative, critical words about life had no place among God's people, I'm a bit freed up from that, because they do have a place for those who want to get together and just talk about life, and talk about the realities of life, and debate life, and, uh, and, say, you know, and say, well, maybe it isn't everything that I had hoped it would be. Uh, almost like an open counseling session where people are honest about what they go through. Now, I'd like to think our churches are that way, but they're not always that way. We do have the purpose of coming to worship God and focus on God, and we don't want them to be a negative experience. The negativism that we find in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, I think, is a realism, a realism by the wisdom teacher saying that this is, this is what life is really like. So I think that idea of Kohelet being the gathering of a wisdom assembly is a much more satisfying idea. Now, Last uh, time we had briefly introduced this, but I want to go, I want to go into more depth on some of the terms in the book. This is really helpful stuff. Um, I would not say this about every book of the Bible. In fact, I wouldn't say this about very. Probably could count on one or two hands how many I would say this. But there are some books that if you do a word study of key words in the book, you have a good handle on what the book is about. That's always a good inductive Bible study method to do word studies of key words, and key words are often repeated words. Uh, repetition is the yellow highlighter of the Holy Spirit, okay? It's one of the yellow highlighters. Repetition is a way that the Holy Spirit gets our attention. And when we see some words that are repeated, we ought to take note of those words because probably they're important in the overall argument of the book. I think Ecclesiastes is a great example. In the New Testament, I would choose the book of Philippians to do this. If you do a word study of often repeated words in the four chapters of Philippians, you have a great understanding of what the book is about, uh, to understand the message overall of the book. Same way here. Key word, or one of the key words, is the word translated vanity. It's the, it's the Hebrew word. Um, find my writing instrument. Here we go. Hey, ball. It's a word that is perfect for this setting. Um, in 1611 King James England, when the word was first translated vanity, vanity was a really good word to translate it in the use of that day. Uh, I think you know that the word vanity itself in our English language leads us a little bit different direction now in our modern use of the word. What do you think of when you think of the word vanity? What's the first thought that pops into your mind? Conceit. Standing in front of a mirror admiring yourself. Vanity. Not exactly what we have here, though that can be a form of what this word is all about. Um, the NIV, as many of you know, has a different translation theory. Uh, it's actually uh, dynamic equivalent is what it is called. Seeking to put into words the idea of what is there at times, even though it may not be the literal translation. Uh, I was interested to see, since I just started using the ESV this year, that the ESV stayed very traditional on this one. And they used the word vanity once again. I think that's fine, as long as you understand what vanity means. But the NIV went a different direction that I find a little cumbersome at times in uh, different verses, but they took it to mean meaningless. And it was very appropriate in terms of its 
the use of that word, uh, dynamic equivalent of the word. Uh, I think I've given, have I given you this slide about the, uh, the word study of Hebel? I'm not sure that I have. Literally what this word translated vanity means is vapor or a breath. So we start there. In a figurative sense, this word can have a variety of meanings, and I put some of them up, up here on the screen. Anything that is superficial, ephemeral, insubstantial, incomprehensible, enigmatic, inconsistent, contradictory. Now that, in one, one place in the Bible, it doesn't mean all of those things. But those would be uh, possible meanings that you would look for as you read this word, the use of this word, the root word, Hebel, in a figurative sense. You can see why the NIV's translation, meaningless, fits into this. If we see things in life in this way, there's a sense of meaninglessness there. Uh, this is out of a, um, uh, of a um, word study, a commentary that referred to this. Hebel portrays the mystery of life that leads to many unanswered and unanswerable questions that must be recognized by the person of faith. So, the wisdom teacher gathers an assembly. And that assembly, some of whom maybe have traveled hundreds of miles to get there, is expecting some profound gem of wisdom to come out of his mouth. But what does Kohelet say? Hebel, Hebel. And then he uses the plural. I think that's Hebelim. Vanity of vanities. And many of you know in the in the Hebrew sense, the superlative degree is the point here. King of kings, Lord of lords, vanity of vanities means the superlative form of this. And a vapor, the quality that we're most interested in identifying in vapor is the thinness of the vapor, the fogginess of the vapor. Life is the thinnest of vapors would be a literal translation here. Vanity of vanities would just mean the thinnest. Life is the thinnest of the vapors. You know, the literal meaning here is a very interesting illustration of life. Um, what is the characteristic of fog or vapor? Well, I drove in some this morning when I left my house. Uh, sometimes we live, where we live, which is only about a half mile from the ocean, we get some pretty thick fog that rolls off the Pacific especially at the end of a Santa Ana condition or something like that. And I've seen it come rolling down our street, almost like a, a big blanket. And within minutes, you move from this crystal clear California air, well, almost clear, <laughs> in, in Los Angeles, to this, you're enveloped in this fog. It's so thick sometimes that you feel you can reach out and grab a handful of it. And that's the nature of fog. It seems like it has substance. It's visible. But when you try to grab a handful of fog or vapor, there's, there's nothing substantial there. It's a great illustration, I think, of what, what this book is trying to say about life. Hebel portrays something that seems to have substance and is worth pursuing, but when we really try to grab onto it, it proves to be empty in some way. Uh, questions that seem to have answers that are unanswerable. So this, this idea of uh, the thinnest of the vapors. So back to a quote I shared with you on our first look at Ecclesiastes. Maybe Marlon Brando was right. Marlon Brando, remember, a, a man, as far as we know, who did not know God, just a short time before his death, said this, life is a mystery. You can never understand what it's all about. And then you come to your last breath, and you look back and you say, well, what was that all about? Now, I hope that most of us who know God would not be saying this at the end of our lives. 
But there's an element of Marlon Brando's words here that remind us of the pursuit of every person in life to find the meaning, and maybe that meaning is never found. Um, we hope that we would be able to come to the end of life and to, to find that meaning. So, uh, Hebel, or a form of the word, the translated vanity, is 36 times. Several different words that have to do with labor, or work, or toil, are used in, in the book. Um, in fact, one of the, the verses we're introduced immediately to this, chapter 1 once again, is, what does a man gain by all of the toil at which he toils? There's a noun and the verb form. The toil at which he toils under the sun. So we have a good example there immediately in the introduction to the words. In the book, labor, work, toil just has to do with the, all the activities that we do, all the pursuits of life. It's not necessarily only talking about what we would call work, Certainly much of it is labor and work, but just all of the pursuits of all areas of life. We labor, we work, we toil, and so forth. Much of it, the focus being on, on the jobs that we do in our life. The question that's being asked, and here's another repeated word, nine times in the book. You can see why the introduction is, in fact, an important introduction, because it includes all of these words. Um, verse 3, a great example. What does a man gain, that's this word gain, by all of the toil at which he toils under the sun? Uh, gain is, the, the word translated here, gain, or profit sometimes, is the word that simply means, um, it's an accounting term. Uh, when all of the um, income sources are received and all of the bills are paid, I'm going by my own checkbook now, uh, in a given month, what's the bottom line? What am I left with? What is the gain? What is the profit? In business, it would be the profit margin that one would have, and I'm probably not using exactly the right term there. But what, what is after, after the in and out financially, what is left over? And the question that's being asked in verse 3 is applying this to life. What does a person gain by all of his toil under the sun? I'm going to be really morose right here. Um, I have had the opportunity through the years to do a lot of funerals. And many of them were for Christian families because being a pastor, you obviously often perform the, 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 the funerals um, for their loved one. But um, I've done a, quite a few funerals for families who didn't know the Lord at all and uh, who requested a pastor because they wanted some kind of a religious ceremony, and I ended up being that pastor. I actually found it to be a very meaningful and fulfilling contact with them. Zach, I'm envisioning your role as a chaplain to be like that too. Uh, people get in situations sometimes where they're really interested in more than just superficial things in life. And I found that at funerals, people were very attentive, much more than at weddings, by the way. <laughs> at weddings, people don't want to hear the pastor give this eloquent message. They're only interested in the bride and the groom. Funerals, not so. People think about their mortality. And as I sat down with families and talked through this, I would often then finish the funeral by going with them to the graveside. And we read the 23rd Psalm, something like that, prayed, and sometimes stayed around, and the body was lowered down into the grave. And you walk away. Sorry if I look very callous here, but, but we could ask a question. So, what was this all about? What is left from this person's life? After all of the experiences, all of the life that is there, what is left? That's the question that's being asked here. What does a man gain by all of the activities that you do 
under the sun? And as Christians, we have a good answer to that, I think, because the things that we do in this life can have eternal, can have eternal results, so that we know that by making the right choices, we are not just tied to this life, but we're tied to a life beyond this life as well. We have an answer that there can be a prophet, but most people don't, that there isn't very much. And then we've been moving all around this term, but this is a very important term, as you might imagine. Um, it's the box of our puzzle earlier in, in our class today. Life under the sun. It is, it's our ability only to see, and I'm speaking of man in general, of human beings, only to see life from, from the ground level. And all the pursuits, we get so active in all of those pursuits. What, is, what does all of this mean in life under the sun? Because God's name is carefully interjected, and by the way, that is a oft-repeated term, 40 times in this book. This is not a term, this is not a book devoid of God. This is a book that brings God into the discussion. But because God's name is interjected at different points, I think a good definition of under the sun is life on this earth without any spiritual dimension to it. Life under the sun is life from a perspective that is only considering the meaning of this world rather than beyond this world. Therefore, that's the focus of Ecclesiastes. That's the wisdom. I wanted to read just again a couple of quotes uh, out of Kidner here. He's reflecting on different approaches to the book. And um, he says just a couple of, in a couple of ways here. Um, yeah, here we go. The entire book faithfully reflects the groaning and the travailing of an exceptional mind one which scorns to present a case which leaves out anything that would threaten it, threaten it. In this view, and this is the view that I presented a moment ago, number three on our list, Kohelet is tortured by each fresh evidence of futility and tragedy. And he indeed twists the knife in his own wound. Uh, I'm actually, re <laughs> I knew something was wrong there. I'm reading the wrong quote, okay? <laughs> uh, need to go to the next page. Here's the point I want to make. Kohelet is addressing the general public whose view is bounded by the horizons of this world. He meets them, he meets us on our own ground, and he proceeds to convict us of its inherent vanity. The point of that quote is, we are bounded by the horizons of this world. One other quote. Throughout the book, with the rarest of disclaimers, Kohelet shocks us into seeing life and death strictly from ground level <coughs> and into reaching the only conclusions from that standpoint that honesty will allow. See, this is what I think we're on good, solid ground when we, when we look at the book this way, that under the sun is not producing pessimism, but it is producing an honest view, I like to use the word realism, the realism of one viewing his life when you are limited to life under the sun, when you can only see it through a human perspective, rather than bringing God into that perspective. The beauty of the book, though, is it does bring God into the perspective in selected ways, but the majority of the book is, is confusing to many, to many Christians. If we can help them to understand this point that we are viewing here, that, that, that the philosopher is viewing life under the sun, I think it really helps a great deal to interpret many of the passages. And this is a valid way to view life because this is the way our neighbors and our friends view life, who do not know God. They do not have any way of breaking free from a, a, the vantage point of viewing life under the sun. And that's why I find the, the, the book of Ecclesiastes so powerful in addressing the issues of Americans today. 
uh, as we go through the book, and you've done, I know, a little bit of interaction already on some questions, we find the pursuits of Kohelet, as he tries to find meaning in life, are the same kind of pursuits that the modern man seeks to find meaning. And, and all of those pursuits give a certain promise that if you just go down this road, whether it be power or wealth or fame, whatever it might be, if you just go down this road, you're going to find the pot of gold at the end. Kohelet here is, is allowing us to go through that same experience in the, in the way that the book is written. I want to remind you again where this, going to the first question, where the poem comes. It's right after what we would call the introduction. And the introduction here is, is filled with the theme of the book, um, Vanity of Vanities, like going back, I think he's introducing this writing in, the, in, this, uh, in this first chapter with the theme summarized and then, and then an, a poem that is going to illustrate what he's trying to say. Um, vanity of vanities, says Kohelet, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does a man gain by all of his toil at which he toils under the sun? Uh, with that bombshell of a question, then we are introduced to this poem. Um, what, do you, what do you think? What, uh, what are you hearing in the poem? What important ideas are there? Maybe even more important, what kind of a mood is created? Or is Kohelet attempting to create in the poem? Any suggestions? Don't be bashful. Caitlin? Okay, I'll ask Frank then. Did you hear, hear did you get in on that discussion? Maybe not all of it. Huh? Okay. Depressing? <laughs> Good place to start. Okay, do we have uh, and may, did did your group come up with anything similar? Depressing, despair. Why? What I mean is, how, how is, what kinds of things are brought up here that are depressing or lead to despair in the poem? Specifics now. Zach? Why, okay, no achievement, that would be something that's rather depressing. Um, I'm throwing this out to everyone. Why, why is this depressing? Are we led to believe that there is really accomplishment, do you think? Certainly we're promised certain things if we can accomplish things. Talk to me, what are, what are the things do you hear here that are, that are not, not the ideal, Sean. There's just no lasting impact. Like, you know, there's no remembrance of the feeling of accomplishment. Yeah, lasting impact. When specifically from where are you seeing that? Uh, verse 11. Okay. There's no remembrance of men of old, even though they're yet to come, will not be remembered by those who follow. It's like okay. You do something, and then there's a whole new cycle. The next generation does the same things you did. But nobody remembers them. Yeah. So what is it? What so what does it matter what we do if there's no remembrance of any of this? If there's no value seen in in the future? David, did you secede from the union here? Are you? Oh, you're <laughs> you're plugged in. I see. Okay, gotcha. Okay. 
I'm not a philosopher, would this be fatalism? That there's nothing of lasting value here, nothing that I try. What, do you, what else are you hearing here that is rather depressing or despairing? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. We should have more to look to than just the things that we see here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And remember, in life under the sun, this is all that people see. This is all that people see. Um, what, el what else are you hearing here about? For example, uh, Zach, you raised the... the uh, nature illustrations that are here. It talks about the sun rising and setting, wind blowing, what, what, the streams flowing and so forth. What, what is the point of those? Those aren't things that human beings participate in. What are those illustrations seeking to do or to show? Mm -hmm. So nothing really different. You probably can remember one or two lanes of the two great leaders. Mm -hmm. But uh, their lanes means nothing to us, really, as a person. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a glimpse or some picture of their life. But for the real person, it has no meaning at all. And in China, mm -hmm. we have a saying that uh, when the people die, it's like the night goes off. Just done. And it's, uh, so whatever friend you think you, so it's just a compared to this nature, a generation comes, generation goes, you really see there's nothing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a bit of meaningless. Mm -hmm. and, it's, uh, mm -hmm. and I think implied in all, all that your several of you have said is we would like to think that with all the effort we put into life, that there is something that's a contribution to someone, to our world, or to whatever. And even better than that, that we are making a contribution that is lasting somehow. And this kind of shatters that dream a bit, doesn't it? That I might, I might not ever be remembered, or I'm, not that we all want to be remembered historically, but just that the things are really not as lasting as we think they are. I wanted to also bring up a question. We haven't answered the question, I think, about the nature aspect of it. Why is that in here? But another question relates to there's a number of things that talk about um, <coughs> men cannot, uh, the, uh, here's verse 8. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What do you think that means? The eye is not satisfied with seeing the ear with hearing. And are there any contemporary things that go on that you think might be an illustration of that? Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so the satisfaction that we think we're going to find in something, it never really gets found. These all go to, uh, to this statement, there's nothing really new under the sun. Now remember, under the sun is life on this earth as we know it. Nothing really new. What do, you, what do you think? If that is intended to create a negative mood, why is that discouraging? If there's nothing really new. Or that we're not going to come up with something that the eye is not satisfied with seeing, the ear is not satisfied with hearing. If you think about the way our world functions, um, marketing is totally based on, I shouldn't say totally, but a lot of it is based on coming up with new things that you've never experienced before. And they're bigger and they're better than anything that you have. And so what do, what do we do? We put money into them, we buy them, because we think we're getting a new experience. And the claim here is that as the generations have gone on, as all those eons of time have gone on, there really isn't anything that's new. There's nothing new under the sun. It is a recycling, if you will, of old ideas. Now, I, I think we could all agree that there are new New things, electronic age and so forth, is going to be different than three centuries ago. But <coughs> basic things that we look to to fill the meaning in our life are not going to be really new. Um, Mm -hmm. I have this earnest of heart that I'm going to be that bad guy for them. Mm -hmm. And then the point I realized, they cannot. I can be simply repeat it. Mm. These mistakes have been done, maybe not even born. But it's the same thing. And then you realize society in general, you want to make a better society, you want to do something. But then you realize this society is going to just repeat the mistakes of the same again. Very depressing for me. <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah. you see it's a track to end, but it, in your void body, you are, you are just taking this thing apart. Yeah. And it's, you know it's not going to end well. You, know, you are doomed to go in this way forever. Yeah. You know, so it's it's kind of an inevitable cycle that goes on and that we have no control over. It's just like every Thanksgiving you eat and you eat too much, you, you don't like that Thanksgiving, the same thing, and you just repeat mm -hmm. it. Yeah. <laughs> You know, on, on the experiences about nothing new under the sun, um, I doesn't have enough of seeing the ear of, of hearing. Um, I think about um, I think about how entertainment, the entertainment world, is so filled with promises of new experiences that are going to be so much better, or at least going to be a measure better than the old. Um, we, if you like going to movies, I know my wife and I like going to movies, we see the best movie we've ever seen in our life, okay? It just is the ultimate. I don't know how many, I'm old enough now to remember a lot of movies that I thought was the best one I've ever seen in my life. And I will admit there are things about them that get better, but there's something in movies that has to be there that so many of them, if not almost all of them in our present present time are really lacking, and that is a good script, well-written movies. And I'm showing a little bit of what I like in a movie, but I do like a story of some sort. I'm, I'm not an existentialist that you know, just wants flo ideas floating around. I want a story of some kind. Um, I think Hollywood and writers are a bit bankrupt in this area because there's not a lot of new things that they can come up with. And this is why you will often find movies, old movies, repeated and recycled. And basically the story is brought into a, into a new movie in order to sell it, but writers come up with very little new creative stuff. Television deals with this all the time, and so our, our minds are kind of dumbed down because nobody can come up with anything anymore. And um, Every once in a while, a little glimmer comes through of just a very creative new idea. 
but not very often. Most of the ideas are old ideas that are recycled. Um, aren't music styles never ending? Talking about the ear. Um, we're always looking for different or new experiences, and we all have our preferences and so forth, but even in the area of music, we, th we see something, or hear, I should say, hear something that is kind of the ultimate experience, we think, but then something will come along and replace it that will be a more popular style of music, a more, more popular song. I'm glad for all the creativity, but these never-ending cycles never get anywhere. They never get anywhere. There's, there's not an end to them. And um, these are some points that I think are kind of underlying the, the, the ideas that you talked about in your group. And the one that I want to go back to that I don't think we've talked about is the, why are the nature illustrations there? I think the nature illustrations are there, and let me read them. Um, the sun rises, verse 5, the sun rises, the sun goes down. And then it hastens back to the place where it rises again. So every day we have this cycle of the sun. The wind blows to the south, the wind goes to the north. Round and round it goes. And on its circuits, the wind returns. Streams run into the sea. But the sea never gets full. To the place where the streams flow, they will flow again. Interesting nature illustrations has nothing to do now with human experiences, but one of them is east-west, one of them is north-south, one of them is up-down, uh, vertical and uh, vertical up-down. Uh, sun rising is an east-west experience. The wind is blowing to the north and then it's blowing to the south. The water cycle, the, by the way, this is a great ancient description of a water cycle, that the rains, the water, um, goes into the sea, all streams run into the sea. The sea never gets full. Obviously, we know scientifically it's evaporated out of the sea up into the clouds. And we have this never-ending water cycle. So what do we see in nature? I think we see a lot of motion, a lot of motion that gives the facade or it gives the impression like there's really something being accomplished here. But nature itself shows us that these are never-ending cycles. These go round and round. They never get anywhere in the sense of going a step further. And that is taken then, I think, into the activities, verse 8 to 11. Uh, All things are full of weariness. A man cannot honor it. The eye is never satisfied with seeing. The ear filled with hearing. What is it that sells, that makes people want to go to movies? We want to see something fresh and new. Um, I might have a favorite movie that I'll buy a DVD and watch it a few times, but that's not going to happen very often. After I've seen even a really good movie once, that's enough for me. I want to move on to the next experience. And you know, In our electronic world, I think there's many of those anticipation of next experiences. The whole entertainment world is based on this, both in the music area and the movie making area, those next experiences. Um, and those next experiences promise to be the bigger and the better, and there's a lot of activity, but we never seem to get anywhere. Uh, I think there's an, a French proverb that says, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And there's a lot of truth to that, that in many ways there's really not any new ideas, there's just a recycling of ideas that have been around for a long time, put put into a different form. Probably the most sobering to me, though, and some of you have mentioned this in your comments, is now we get to the lives of people, and we find in uh, verse 4 and verse 11, I think this is, these are bookends, if you will. These, this is a frame. The same idea introduces the poem and ends the poem, verses 4 to 11. A generation comes, a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. And then verse 11, there's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things. Um, 
Let me tell you about an Ecclesiastes moment that I didn't even know anything about Ecclesiastes. But as I look back on it, it was really an Ecclesiastes moment. Um, I had a wonderful grandmother, but two wonderful grandmothers who both lived to be into their early 90s. And one of them, my grandma Hutchison, actually lived to be 93 years old, I think. Uh, I knew her very well because we actually lived with her for a part of my life. And uh, so I had a relationship with her all the way up until the time she died. I knew my grandma Hutchison really well. Um, Hard-working farm wife, farm uh, mother who had just all of her life devoted to, you know, to good hard work and so forth. I learned a lot of things from her. Um, I also heard a lot of stories from her, and and. Um, I didn't value it in those days when I was a young kid, but my grandma would tell me a lot of stories about our family. And I'd heard many of the, about the many of the people in our family. So after my grandma died in her 90s, we as a family then were cleaning out her house. And we made our way into, I was in, in her room alone, I think at the time, if I remember right. And I discovered this picture. Um, it was a picture of somebody I had no idea who this is. But on, I could tell by the note on the picture that it had been written to my grandmother, and it was really a close relative or someone that was very close in our family, and yet I had no idea who it was. And so I looked at it for a while and said, said to myself, I wonder who that is, and realized there's no way of knowing, and so I put it down and and then an Ecclesiastes moment hit me, and that is someday someone's going to find my picture, and they're going to pick it out, and they're, they're going to say, I wonder who that is. I wonder what made him tick. I wonder what his life was all about. And they're going to put it on, and they're going to walk away. That was a really powerful thought to me at the time, and later on as I reflected on this generations come and generations go, I realize, do any of us have any lasting significance? Now remember, don't let yourself be pulled, oh well, of course we do as Christians. We're doing good works on this earth so that we might glorify God and all that. No, 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 we can't go there right now. This is life under the sun, okay? Let Ecclesiastes have its moment viewing life the way people view life. And that is, we think that we are going to do a lot. That's what I think the nature illustrations are. There's a lot of activity going on. It's to picture human activity, to a lot of activity. We think we make progress at some points, but really we don't. And in the final analysis, the generation that I'm in is going to pass away, and no one's going to remember me. Life under the sun is sobering at times. It is really sobering. And that's why I have encouraged people, and I would encourage you too, as you study this book, um, don't just write off some of these ideas as not important. Let, give some thought to the wisdom of all of this, because I think these Ecclesiastes statements really help us to go back and grapple with what true life is all about. Uh, apart from God, we don't have a lot. <laughs> apart from God, our world doesn't offer us anything that is really lasting. And I think I, think I would agree with your analysis of the mood, and that's the whole point here is... Kohelet is trying to get us to think in those terms, that we're forced to look for meaning elsewhere because we're just not going to find it in life under the sun. Now, uh, there was a second question that I know you did some work on individually, too. Um, let's brainstorm a bit, just out loud. What are some of the areas that you found listed in Ecclesiastes, especially this list in 116? Let me, let me introduce the comment here uh, with a couple of things. I think what we find here is an introduction as we move past the, the first poem of the book, where Kohelet is telling us about a 
for lack of a better word, I'm going to say a lab experiment that he did. He's a wisdom teacher. His whole job in life is to try to analyze life. And so he, he set out to pursue, and this is why the persona of Solomon becomes very important. He set out to pursue meaning in life in every possible way that he could. And a part of what is found in the heart of the book is the notes from someone who carried out this lab experiment, who pursued life in different areas in order to find meaning, obviously. And ultimately, we're going to see his conclusions as he comes to the end of the book. But I would also add, next week we're going to look at some conclusions that are even sprinkled throughout the book. So he says in verse 12, I, Kohelet, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under, the, under heaven. Now, what are some areas in which he seeks to find meaning? Just name them out loud. Excuse me? Okay, good. Possessions. Could we put along with this one maybe money? kind of go hand in hand here. All that he could own, all the money and possessions. What else did you find? Pleasure. Okay, pleasure. Laughter. What do you think he means, uh, not, not to camp on something, what do you think he means by laughter? Like, if, if you observe somebody doing what, you would say, oh, this guy's pursuing laughter. What would that be? Is that? Okay. Entertainment could be very much a part of this, couldn't it? Uh, especially entertainment that is just, um, causes you to be happy. Happy, in, maybe in this case, in the more superficial use of that word. Okay, good. Uh, what are some other things? Achievements, okay. Others? Sex? Where did you find that one? Yeah, okay. Many concubines delight, the delight of the children of man. So we would assume that when he refers to a big harem, which by the way would be one of, another one of the credentials why Solomon would be a good candidate here. Um, when he speaks of the delight, we definitely know that he means how sexual relations give you, give you that delight. It isn't just beautiful women around him, it's sex that is part of it. What else? Okay, interesting one. I'm going to put another uh, word here that I think is in the discussion, and that's wisdom. And we need to explain this one a bit. This is not as clear as some of the others. Okay, let's go on with our list, though. Do you see any others? Have we missed any? Excuse me? Power. Okay, good. Reputation, and I'm, I'm going to put with that one, Frank, um, fame. Any others? I suppose we could include this under one of them, but he talks about having many singers. Uh, both men and women. Uh, maybe we should include this 
under pleasure laughter, but entertainment is is uh, looking for sources of entertainment, keep himself entertained. Okay, we haven't mentioned this one. Um, wine, alcohol for stimulation. I think we have a pretty, pretty good list here. Uh, Ivan, if you don't mind me asking you, when you talked about power, would you be thinking of things like where he buys slaves and has slaves and so forth? Okay, okay, I see the position, his position as a king. Now, do I need to even ask this question because it's such a dumb one? Is, do we have any parallel to today? <laughs> I don't think there's a more, uh, I don't think there's a better time in history nor a place in history than, than 21st century America to talk about the relevance of Ecclesiastes. Um, this is where many people live. Uh, this is where many Christians live. Out of the list that we've talked about, do you see particular ones that you think are one of the biggest downfalls today? By downfalls, I just meant they tend to trip people up with wrong priorities. What would that be? I see some heads shaking. <laughs> Name some. Frank, if I could have you name Okay. That's a good choice. In what way achievements, where would you see that reflected in society? I'm not a perfect writer, Frank. I'm just observing people and what they're doing. And that would be? One can hear. Americans are very good, I think, with the in one hand. Like to write, keep your hands up. Okay. And they Americans are always trying to write like, oh, you have done this, it's great. And, and you go to like a concert, oh, this is the greatest concert, uh, you know, and American literature champion, not the Mr. American, but Mr. Universe or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's a kind of a, a bopped up image of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to see that we are different. We're trying to make, want to do something, make, you know, even do something to others, make mm -hmm. their sense. So the experiments mm -hmm. is uh, really, you know, how do we really achieve through our mundane everyday life? And it's a big mm -hmm. thing, but uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of a... It's a good observation. Really? Good observation. Do you think that is not as much true in Chinese society? Oh, in China, we talk about the group achievements. Yes, yes group, group achievements. achievements. Interesting. If anyone talk about the individual achievements, it's kind of a taking of a... Uh -huh. I don't think the group achievement is better because it's... Yeah. Like that. But, uh, um, yeah, it's a great, you know, both the Chinese and Americans, we all want to achieve something. Okay. It's just in different ways. Yeah. But it's a huge thing. Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me wrap it up. I think we could say a, a quite a bit about a number of these. Um, it's interesting you bring out the area of group, of individual achievement, how, how common it is that we define ourselves by what we've done by what we've accomplished, and, um, and, uh, the, and men especially would be guilty of this. I'm, I know I'm stereotyping here, but men will always talk about what their job is as their identity. This is all a part of my identity. And by the way, I think that can and does creep over into our Christian experience too. Um, where our measurement of ourself in ministry is often the things that we've accomplished. And unfortunately, the, there's pressure always to measure ourselves that way because our churches and other Christian groups will measure us that way, the things that we've accomplished. I hope from your seminary education there'll also be value placed on how God, how, how your faithfulness to God 
is, is ultimately the most important thing. Uh, even if others might measure you in different ways, that faithfulness to God and that walk with God is, is such a key idea. idea. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.